Radio Verte presents A Hooger by Corey Zimmerman. Smokey Joe, Act Three. A distant train whistle springs open my eyelids with a suffocating gasp. Where am I? I ask myself for the umpteenth time this week alone. And now? How do I feel? Horrible. I lunge for a trash can, but with nothing by the nightstand to toss up the night, I trip over scattered clothing for the window, vomiting out my guts in three gut-wrenching heaves. I nearly smack my head on the brick wall of the building just across the way, taking a few deep breaths of cool morning air. I open my eyes to see stars amongst a narrow blade of sunlight. With another breath, the sulfur scent of the city burns my sinuses. I struggle to pull it together, blurrily, making out the peeling wallpaper wrapped around me like a damp cloth and turning back the unmistakable shape of a female hip bone. With a stir and a soft voice, good morning, handsome. Hey, I say, stepping back over scattered clothing before dropping back into bed. The hip bone. Her dark hair drapes off her face, makeup smudged on the pillow, as she pulls my pounding head down toward her breastbone. She runs her nails down my neck as goose pimples arise on my arms. My stomach rumbles in a cocktail of nausea and glee. I moan, not sure what it means, as she kisses me on top of the head. Can I ask you something? I say. Sure, she says. Where am I? But with her crazy cackle, it all comes flowing back to me. Oh, I say. Yeah, she says, holding me tight. Cadence. Barrel run. A nice truck awaits in an abandoned freight tunnel, lost and forgotten beneath the city, built after the Great Fire, where coal was once railed to furnaces in a string of basements running north to south just below South Wacker Drive. Three men, one calmly smoking a cigarillo in a three-piece suit, fedora tie and overcoat, with one polished shoe on the wheel well of a silver ghost, clearly calculated. Two, identically dressed, straight-backed, motionless, a rather severe pair of straight lips under a thin mustache, confirming each calculation with a slight nod. Three, workman's Levi's, dirty shirt, suspenders, scuffed-up boots, scruffy face, anxiously pacing about, long having rubbed his bulbous nose raw. Meter. One sparkles in a state of unmistaken suspicion at the four of us. The four of us. Nick, the muscle, short body swung about by swollen arms. Jameson, the veteran, a former merchant marine. Henry, but a redhead boy, skinny, Irish, and covered in grime. And me, Following their lead, I unload barrels made of wood slaves bound with steel hoops from the truck, rolling a good dozen just inside a dark shaft out of sight. One, slate blue slacks, leans on the silver ghost with class. Two, buffs a smear off the chrome with a square of silk. Three, grinds the gears of the ice truck and reverses down the tunnel until the headlights are swallowed by darkness. The engine of the silver ghost rumbles to a start, and with a nod, its angry purr is doused in the void. Jameson suggests we get at it, rolling barrels down the shaft until we reach the sewer. Alternation Betty and I danced the nights away to the chaotic mess resonating deeply in the marrow of our time, into the anarchy in the freedom we embrace. Pelvis to pelvis, sweaty, seething with gin, 
within the haze of the blue ecstatic lusciousness that is jazz, jazz, jazz. Double time. I grab one end of the back-breaking barrel and slosh through a city's worth of excrement amongst a million rats scurrying underfoot. Only two of the four wear miner's lamps on our heads, and I ain't one of them. I hope for Christ's sake, we neither will extinguish in such a ghastly place, as undoubtedly we would be devoured alive by these vermin the size of a large man's shoe in no time. I kick a good dozen off my leg before climbing into the next coal tunnel. Double time feel. Looking into one another's eyes, our hearts pump in time with the stand-up bass as the lead sings a muddy, sexy melody of a river of booze and lovers and lemon drops. I swing Betty around and pull her in tight, my hands melting into her hips, one thing on her mind, and it ain't lemon drops. Chord. A coal cart sits on a pair of tracks. Nikki and I lift the barrel into the cart before the other two pull it back by a rope. We keep moving. There is no time to waste, says Jameson, as we pass the final furnace. Ducking through a chiseled out hole, just wide enough for the barrel to squeeze through a series of basements connected by doors, of which only one man has a key, and it ain't me. Jameson, always in front. Me, always in back. The whole process, well scripted, has been run a thousand times by men better than me. Ballad. The night grows late. Her dancing legs tire. Instead of collapsing into a booth, Betty suggests we split. She pulls me by the hand to the fourth floor. Out of breath, she slips off her dress and stands before me in the nude. My eyes lay on her milky flesh in flawless curves. Her ripe pear figure, her belly as flat as a hotcake, glistening, her breast perky and pink. Betty holds out her hand and motions me forward with a finger. She places her palm about my beating chest and unbuttons my chilled, sweat-soaked shirt. Outro. The final stretch lets barrels gently roll down a narrow concrete corridor beneath the candy shop's 120-year-old red brick foundation. The ceiling is low, and I smack my head no less than a good dozen times before reaching the half door, where just inside, Rosemary applies a thick layer of lipstick in the mirror, adrenaline coursing through my veins. I am exhilarated as she turns and says, What? Expecting a round of applause? Rosemary carries a straight razor in her stockings. Feline I pull Betty in and smell her hair, that sweet, syrupy scent. I kiss her damp neck and feel her pulse on my lips. I drop down on the bed and she sits on my lap, bouncing up and down as I slap her ass. The bass man, beat, 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 echoing in the loins. Can I smell you? She wants to know, nudging my armpit with her nose. You smell so fucking delicious, she says. I gotta piss, I say, tossing her off me to scribble every word of it in the john. I must admit, I don't want to forget. I return to see her in my shirt. I push her onto the bed and lay on top of her with my wingtips on my feet. She wraps her legs around my thighs, heels shed to the floor, and we go at it. But I can't. I must piss again. Only this time, I really must. And I leave the pin behind, running back to the toilet. I piss. I pull the chain. I return to bed, where she lies face down with a copy of Four Swallows. Are you okay? She asks, closing the hollowed out book. In her voice, is anyone? Black panties, satin, ass like an hourglass. I take a swig from the bottle from the book. You make me okay, she believes, looking back with a fisheye, reaching up to scratch at my face so sexful. The piano trickles up through the floorboards, and the French lady sings French jazz below. Something of love, but something amiss. An empty glass so tricky to fill. A grasp, nonetheless. Outer voice says nothing at all.
Line up. Maddox on the sex. Sends back the stick loin, even though it's on the house. Even though it looks mighty tasty. He not only abstains from food, but avoids touching anyone. In the groupies Krampus style, Maddox prefers solitude. Finding calm by envisioning the ocean back on the Alabama coast. Just a skip and a hop from the old plantation where he was born. He goes there in his mind any time, for hours at a time, behind the curtain, in the john and on stage, making sure to arrive at the joint at least two hours before the show, shit showered and shaved and ready to blow. Leroy, on the bone, goes by Lee. Leroy applies a series of remedies, one by one, to which he attributes his success. Glycerin and honey to clean out his pipes. Maalox for the occasional stomach pain, ethyl nitrate for his face, purgatives to rid him of toxins, and finally a unique balm explicitly prepared by a German trombonist to alleviate his chronic lip ailments and keep them strong. Leroy cleans up side stage before a hand mirror with pomade, tweezing any stubborn hair follicles right out of their pores before he hugs and kisses all the ladies in the room. For good luck, so he claims. And only now can he slowly start to relax, first taking a swig of cognac, followed by a cool glass of water. Lee quietly says a prayer to himself while the rest of the band sets up on stage. He lets out a scream and with the stomp of the foot, he is ready for the spotlight, which is painstakingly readjusted repeatedly at his order. Joe on the trumpet has been a fan of boxing since childhood and takes on the pre-fight practices of his favorite fighters. George Dixon, Barbados Joe Walcott, George Gaines, Jack Johnson, and middleweight Southpaw Theodore Flowers. Like Maddox, Joe prefers to leave himself unsatisfied before the performance by abstaining from food and women. Not a taste of sex, he claims, leaves him hungry. The trumpeteer also makes a point of not shaking anyone's hand before going on stage, fearing the oil will throw off his plane, but when necessary extends only his south paw. Rosemary, patron saint of jazz, loves to bust Joe's balls. You in the wrong house you think I'm going to tiptoe around your delicate sensibilities, Joe. You can take those velvet gloves and get on, she says, walking out from behind the bar. Now get on in here, as she extends her arms wide. Joe, putting on a pair of shoes, one size too small, to feel his feet firmly planted on the stage, flouts Rosemary by bending over to tie them as tightly as possible without breaking a string, as Rosemary laughs it off, calling him a sucker. On the drums, Brown keeps quiet keeping off a psychic distance to himself, preferring to see performing as a natural part of his day rather than a special occasion. He goes about his usual regimen, screwing on the cymbal, checking the snare with a sizzle, and the big drum with a kick, after which he enjoys a large meal on the house, steak and eggs and a cool glass of milk. Marshall, on the clarinet, the youngest in the quintet, takes out his ironing board on stage, a sort of ceremony preparing and ironing his suit, feeling that even if it doesn't end up going well, audiences will say, at least he was clean. Louis, the ever loyal doorman, digs his shoulder blades into the steel door upon which he leans, not only his employment, but his self-regard. Oscar Clyde Olson nurses a gin in the back corner. It's relatively early, but I'm already exhausted. Running barrels has become many days amongst one long night in this absolute mess of paradise. I toss back my glass, walk to the bar, grab a bottle, and go up to the dingy flat that is this jazz age. Lips blue by Christmas, I sit at my small table, warming my bones by the bottle ice pick of a pin, and thawing words amidst a mind ravaged by the whirlwind of my time here on this southern block. Flooded with memories, I forsake and sleep for some weeks, the haint blue haze that engulfs me. I try to forget, but it all gets more complicated with time. The witching hours are not yet upon me, so I curse, yank my hair, haunted by the pre-night, haunted by you, 
And once more, I fantasize of throwing myself out the window to the street below, where I might bleed out on that cold stone. I crumple another sheet, toss it into the can, go down the hall to piss, pull the chain, return, and begin anew. Tune. Headlights expose the frayed soul of the drunkard stumbling through the street at night. A hoo cracks his mind wide open as he veers a foot to the left, sloshing through slush, cursing and threadbare to the bone. His worn soles meet the wet, cold chill called life with deep familiarity. The stone reverberates painfully up his split shins, exposed and alive, and he knows it, seemingly afraid to die in so many ways. Yet the rhythm of the city carries him on. Hooves trot past as the city celebrates all that is wrong and all that is right. And anyone who passes along the way is simply alone in their thoughts of a world other than his own. A man amongst many. A man all alone. Couples whisper as do circles of fellows on frozen stoops. In balconies crumbling under the weight of man. He is known well enough, yet not at all. By and by, they glare on. As beyond on the stone, the slow gait of a horse, its teary eye, which may or may not be pulling a buggy, sets the beat of his heart. I write this nonsensical dribble until my pen runs dry and stop to pour another drink. I watch from my window as the silhouette of a drunkard disappears in a fresh cascade of snow. I hear a far-off scream, but see no one else on the street. I throw back my gin and pour another, as yet another AHOOGA startles my soul. Knock knock. But not in that way. I drop my pen, gather my writings, and shove them under the bed like some secret plan. Forbidden confessions. I gather myself in a breath, walk to the door, and turn the handle in wonder in some unknown fear, expecting a knife to the gut, a bullet to the crown, certain death, at least. And in only moments notice, Betty has me against the wall, red lips smeared all over my own, her shaky hands and that familiar anxious hunger. I explore her well-acquainted figure as I seek an undiscovered curve of flesh. We scramble to remove each other's clothes. I lift her gown over her head, leaving her hair in a terrible mess, running my fingers through her nest as her pelvic bones meet, wobbly knees, somehow making it to the bed, an awful out-of-breath mess, dripping wet with sweat in a steamy Christmas mess. The stars somewhere beyond the low-lying clouds fizzle and pop in the freeze, veiled above this slush-ridden city, stank and rotten, yet ever so lovely. Upon the wall, our shadows morph into one dull-hued form, one beautiful dance of gray. I sigh deeply as we lay out in this twisted mess, tangled in knots of cotton sheet, yellowed with human stain. We gaze at the ceiling rather into one another's eyes, hers pecan, and my own as blue as a wayward summer day. I lay my head on her belly in a bobs with each labored breath before she slides out from under me with a half smirk. She takes a cigarette from her handbag, walks to the window, and cracks it open. Frigid air pours in. I roll to my side, facing her as the sweat that had beaded on my forehead dries. She appears tense in the eye. The mood has shifted starkly. I kick the sheet from the bed, sit up, stand, and join her by the window looking out over the freshly dusted taint. She sits on the sill, exhaling in the nude, breast just begging to be seen in the kerosene light. She blows another billow of smoke, which is sucked out of the dehumidified room, and tosses her cigarette to the street below, sparks dashed off in the slight breeze. Her nude body is covered in goose pimples, and with a sigh of frustration, she walks about the room in circles, searching for either a strange pair of panties or a way out of this unexpected entanglement. Either way, she curses under her breath as I pour myself a drink to calm my bungled nerves. I swallow, refill the glass, and offer it to her. No thanks, she says with her eyes, lifting the fallen sheet from the floor to shroud her shoulders. 
Settling on the edge of the bed, I sit beside in the slouch of surrender. Go on, what is it? I say, what? She says as I drop back with a sigh of my own. Come on, I say, talk to me. What's going on? I feel like I know you less now than I did the night I met you. What do you want to know? She says, I want to know you. I say, here I am, naked in the buck. I done told you everything. What more do you want to know? My shoe size? She asks. Size six, I say, as she gets up to dress. I can't take it anymore. The silence. Where is she? I throw myself across the room and wake the old floorboards to climb up the musical flight of stairs one flight to Betty's room in search of comfort in a warm body to soothe my woes. Where have you been? I want to ask. I love you, I've decided to say, but I find her chilled mattress, frayed, sprung, cold, and utterly alone. For all but that empty hollowed out copy of Four Swallows and its perfume bottle run dry, I toss it and stumble down three flights of stairs, past a burly man behind a candy counter who has grown somewhat weary of my stale face, and I of his. I ignore his grunt and the jars of candy, which once brought such joy, which never dwindled, and stumble into the lady's room to scamper over my stiff feet down yet another flight of stairs to that ever-calling vault of substance below. As it always is, the air is soggy and humid, steamy with a cocktail of sewer scent and menthol. Only the steel door stops me in my tracks, and I take a moment to take a rotten breath, slick back my greasy hair, and knock twice, and a third with a second knuckle. Louis? Oscar? Louis says she split. For all he knows, hell, off to the Hamptons. Who was he? I ask. A pig trader from the Gold Coast. A real piece of work. He says with a brush of my collar. Flashing that fat wad the way he did. He says. She was a good gal, I say. You know dames these days. He says. Somebody to say goodbye to. I say. Before walking to the bar for a gin. Need a tissue? Asked Rosemary, pouring me my gin. Altered Scale I hardly recognize Betty in the baby blue dress that drops down to the ankle. Hair tight in a bun, heavy lashes now fine-tuned and thin. Thin lips, raspberry gloss rather absurd in the light of day. Suddenly shy, sober, a stranger. The whole shebang a cocktail hour dream, I ask about the eye. It's for the best, she says with eyes of her own as her mother stands scowling from the hall, afraid to enter the flat for lice and mice, her ice-cold glare shivering down my spine as she grips a crucifix in hand. I listen for the words frozen solid on the tip of her tongue, icicles that shall fall and shatter as she scurries about anxiousness, pretending to gather lost things about my room. What are you looking for? I ask. Nothing. I hear her say as she looks at me again soundlessly. I just had to see you one last time. She says without saying. My Bible. She says as I roll my eyes. Four swallows. I want to ask as she clings onto an armful of shoes and a brush as we brush arms. I watch as she melts and seeps through my gaze. Nervous clomps oozing the floorboards as her mother clears her throat. Betty gives me a final glance. I guess it's not here. She says. Troublesome, if anything, with a tinge of shame creased in the corners of the eye, I find the penance applied by her mother's cross that now dangles about her neck. Clinched onto the strap of her purse, her mother clears her throat again through clenched teeth. Come along, she says. Arthur is waiting in the car. Dar-eyed, Betty hands me back a few things of my own, a sock and a tie and I feel the suffocation on both ends as she turns away for the door. Bye, Oscar. Bye, Betty. Stroll. Hurting from the window, I peer down two stories to the street, hoping she turns back but once. Betty, can you hear me? Of course she can't. And as the wind howls and tosses her blue dress about her ankles for the knee, she pauses. Betty, are you there? Of course she's not. Just as her mother, cloaked in lamb's wool and otter fur, grabs her arm with devotion and drags her off for the warmth of the car. 
where Arthur awaits to drive her away for the coast of glittery gold that streams through French doors at dawn. If tomorrow we shall die, I jot down on my pad. It was nice while it lasted. I refill my glass and take four swallows, hard and straight, as I dread dark tunnels and where they might lead. And there is not much more to write home about. Fade out.